we pray for and, and uh, you know, if you get pray for we we talk so much about God's miraculous peace and his joy and his love that we fail to remember that he's also a God that gets uh, wrath. You heard of God's wrath? Read the Old Testament if you want to know about God's wrath. But sometimes we fail to realize that if we don't keep on this path, that we can go to another path and it won't be as pretty. Okay? We have to maintain a relationship with God. We have to maintain a relationship through Christ, our Savior, who came and died for each and every one of us for a purpose. Not because the whole world doesn't see it, it's supposed to happen, but the purpose he came is because his Father needed a perfect sacrifice so that we can have the righteousness and the opportunity to spend an entire eternity with him in heaven. Without that sacrifice, it would never happen. Amen? Amen? You remember what God did? I'm not going to preach. You remember what God did in Genesis when he discovered that Adam and Eve were naked? Remember? Who told you you were naked? What did he do? He clothed them. How did he clothe them? The first sacrifice for sin took place in Genesis. When God took that animal and, you know, made clothes out of it, because the Bible, Bible didn't say they made their own clothes, does it? He clothed them with the sacrifice. Sometimes we forget that God demands, if I can say this right, God demands our faithfulness to what he has already accomplished on the cross. Amen? So don't let anybody bring confusion on you saying Jesus really didn't have to come because he did. He did. Amen? So as we get ready for a time of worship this morning, I want you to give everything you have to God. Everything. Every, every hurt, every pain, every desire. Everything that's never happened to you, you've been praying for, give it to God and let him do. Amen? Father God, we come before you this morning and we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come before you this morning and give thanks to you. Lord, we thank you for Pat Dom. We pray, God, that you would heal her body. We thank you, Lord, that you would touch this condition, whatever it is, and that you would relieve her from it, Lord. Bring a miracle upon her life, Lord, and let that be the next week's testimony. Father, I pray for every veteran in this building. I thank you, Lord, for what they've accomplished, for what they've done in protecting this country and, and answering the call of duty. We thank you, Lord, for all those veterans. We thank you, Lord, for your miraculous power that moves upon each and every heart. Let this day be nothing but glorifying you in Jesus' name. Amen. But I really feel like you do it. Would everybody stand? And I know it might make some of you a little bit nervous, but if you come together and put your arms with each other, get off with each other, uh, all over this. Because you've made us righteous. Mm -hmm. God sees a, a completed sacrifice. Yes. He's called us to be holy yes. as he is holy. He's called us to walk in righteousness as he's given us the mm -hmm. gift. Yes. We thank you today, Lord, that we are arm lockers and not onlookers. Yes. Yes. We thank you today, Lord, that we can come together and worship you and praise you. We come together today, Lord, that we can pray for the generation that's going to follow us in leading the world to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
I pray God you anoint this young man in Jesus' name. I pray God you anoint his friends to hear what he's got to say in Jesus' name. As we come into a time this morning, Lord, of hearing your word and what you have for us, we say thank you that we can be arm lockers, that we can go through and be a light to a darkened world. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like all the men to come forward, or anybody who wants to, give our pastor a blessing. It was only earlier that God had gone through him with healing powers and helped all of us heal and get better. So, thank you, Lord. Anoint this man. Thank you. 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 Praise the Lord. Um, a couple weeks ago, I started in John chapter 15, if you remember. So we're going to continue with that today. So if you all open your Bibles and turn to John chapter 15. The Lord, the Lord just placed this on my heart. Let me pray this way. Father, I pray for peace upon every mind and upon every heart today. I pray for those who have woken up this morning, maybe in an unpeaceful state, maybe worried, doubt, and concerned. I pray in Jesus' name that cast that from me. From this moment on, Lord, I pray for peace. I pray for joy, and I pray for understanding that you are in control. Father, sometimes we look at things with our physical eyes and forget to look with our spiritual eyes to know that you've already accomplished everything that we just need to walk in. In Jesus' name. And all those people said, Amen. Amen. That was for somebody. You don't have a clue who, but somebody. Amen. You know, sometimes you can just see this presence, you would just see this, this un uncomfortableness on people's faces. Okay? It was John chapter 15. In this chapter alone, Christ uses the first personal pronoun with emphasis 11 times. In each case, the chief importance of the word spoken lies in the character of him who speaks it. In these impressive eyes of his, there is thought. Let's start with verse 12 of chapter 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You do not choose me. Have you ever heard somebody walk around saying, I'm looking for God? I'm looking for God? I'm going to choose God? What's it say right here? You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. That your fruit should, be, should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know this. That it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, 
Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in the law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, he's talking to his apostles here, is he not? But he's also talking to each and every one of us. Because remember, when... God the Father and God the Son decided to send a sacrifice. You were on his mind. You were on his heart. You were on his thoughts. It's a personal relationship with Christ. I have called you. I have come for you. I have given you what you need to maintain life. I, 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 I. Not some glass jar on a shelf. I. When we understand that by grace he loves us. Turn to, turn to verse 12. Now, I don't want you to get confused with the grace because there's also a false grace, is there not? There's also a false grace, grace that lets you think you can go and do anything you want, premeditated, and God will do will not keep you from doing it. True grace is this. If you mess up unintentionally, His grace is sufficient. Amen? But there comes a difference when you choose to walk in sin. When you choose to walk in a not-so-righteous manner. It's your choice. Amen? Which means you premeditate. Premeditate on what you're going to do next. God has sent His grace... So when we mess up accidentally, he's there to bring us home. Amen? Grace, I have loved you. Verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Today we live in a society, folks, that it's hard to love other people. Isn't it? It's hard to love your enemies. The Bible says, love your enemy as yourself. Some of us don't even like ourselves. How are we going to love anybody? <laughs> Seriously. Right? But aren't you glad you can look in the mirror and you can say, Lord, I am one big failure. But you have redeemed me by your blood. Think what Paul, when Paul got to heaven, all those martyrs, all those people that he condemned, ran up to me. Then he go, oh, there's that guy that killed us. No. His grace is sufficient once you know the reason why he sent the son to shed his blood for you. Nothing matters anymore. Because he'll give you the strength. His grace, you who sometime were far off, but are now near, made near you who were once in ignorance of me. He's come near you and walked with you for all those who were once ignorant who didn't believe in him. Now some of this might be repetitious for you, for some of you in here, but I think we need to understand just because we've heard it once, five hundred, six hundred thousand 600,000 times, it's still new every morning. Amen? 
It still belongs to us as a profession, profession, confession of our faith. In the blood of Christ who's cleansed us, who brought us into a righteous relationship with the Father. His grace is sufficient for me. We have once walked in ignorance and walked according to the course of the world. How many of you remember before the cross? Your main goal in life, whether you recognize it or not, was to walk as the world walked. What did Jesus call the father of the world? Who did Jesus call the father of the world? Satan. Satan's the father of all lies. And murder. And everything else. This is his world. That's why Jesus had to come and sacrifice for you and I to be drawn from the world. Even though we're walking around in it, that doesn't mean we're part of it. Amen? But that's my choice. Do we fail? Oh, yeah. yeah. But aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit will give you the option and give you the wherewithal to reach out and say, God, forgive me. Set me free from this failure. Set me free from this, this thing. Jesus says, I have loved you with a love that can only be compared with that love just as a father has loved me. I love you. I love you. Verse 9. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in me. That was part of the message of a couple weeks ago. Abide in me. Abide in me. Separation, verse 19. Go to verse 19. If you were of the world, and the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We've been separated. We've been separated from the world. If we continue to walk as the world wants us to walk, our separation doesn't mean nothing, does it? You know, it's one thing to be tempted. It's another thing to jump into temptation. Because we are all human. We all have flesh, don't we? So you're going to be tempted every day of your life to do something that you gave up. But the key is this. It might be tempted, because that's what the devil does. The devil tempts, doesn't he? By bringing things to you, by saying things to your ear. He tempts. But unless you fall into that temptation, you're good. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater is the spirit, greater is the son that dwells in you than anything the world has to offer. We've been separated from the world. That doesn't mean we walk around with our head held high and we're, you know, we're kings and queens. No, it just means we know who we are in Christ. Amen? Amen. I chose you. 1 John 5, 19. Look there if you want. The whole world lies in the power of the evil. 1 John 1, 19. To be chosen of Christ is to be called out of the world into his fellowship and kingdom. Understand this for a second, folks. You've been chosen. You've been chosen. You've been chosen to walk with him. You've been chosen to separate from the world. You've been chosen to walk after him and look for his kingdom. What's the Bible say? Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. Some of us take the added unto us as, okay, now you do is sit down, it's going to come. It doesn't work that way, does it? We have a responsibility to walk in righteousness and seek his kingdom first and then everything else will be added to us. You know, I don't need anything from the world. What I want more than anything is the peace of God that surpasses any and all understanding. No matter what I go through, no matter what I see, I know God's peace is sufficient for me. And I think every believer needs to walk in. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter what's going on in your block. It doesn't matter what's going on in the street. What matters is your peace that only comes from the throne room of God. Your peace only comes from Jesus in your heart and the Holy Spirit. What Jesus said, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you a helper. How many of you need a helper? I 
right? But I think a really cool word that these writers use is the word comforter. I'm going to send you the greatest comfort you will ever know. Spirit, I'm going to send you the greatest comfort you will ever know because he's going to take up residence in you. Aren't you? I am so glad today that when I fail, the Holy Spirit is going to abandon me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I thought you were the righteous vessel. I'm going home. <laughs> no, because he's there to see us through every obstacle, through every challenge, through everything that the, that the enemy throws at us. Let me tell you something, folks. Without the Holy Spirit living, living in us, we wouldn't have the power or the authority to do away with the wickedness of the world. We'd be an empty vessel. And let me tell you something. When you cried out and you asked Christ to come into your heart, guess who moved in? The Holy Spirit moved in and he eradicated all that sin. Why? Because the blood of Jesus has made it so. Understand this for a second. The Cain Spirit, and I don't know why God, well, I do know why God brought this into my spirit. The Cain spirit is alive today like it's never been before. What's a Cain spirit? What Cain do to his brother? Kill him. him. That same spirit is alive and evident in the world today. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that revelation that every time you see something going on, it's the Cain spirit that's causing that? Because the Cain spirit wants to kill anybody and everything that's in opposition to what he is. Why did Cain kill his brother? Jealousy. You mean your sacrifice is better than mine? Crack across the head. Hey, how many people do you know in your walk that have that same mentality? Oh, you you think you're all that in a bag of chips because you do this in the church. No, I do this because God has called me you to do what he's called you to do. To be separated. If that's all we accomplish in our walk is to be separate from the world, so be it. Amen? Because as you become separated, you then become a fruit bearer. Right? As you become set like Herschel. I remember Herschel telling me when he first got saved and first started coming here, he was a little nervous to share Jesus. Now I challenge anybody to walk up to him. Because they're going to hear about Jesus. Amen? Why does that happen? Because Herschel finally said, you know what? I give up, Lord. Use me. Use me. Amen? The Cain spirit that seeks those more righteous than themselves is ever with us. The Cain spirit seeks those out who thinks they're better than anybody else. And I got news for you folks. The world is full of people that think they're better than you. The world is full of people that think they're better than anybody. I've seen it. I, hey, I was that guy. Why? I don't know. Because I could never do hardly anything like But my mentality was, you know what? You got nothing on me. Maybe it was a Marine Corps training. I don't know. But anyway, that spirit is alive today and active. It wants to destroy you. We are chosen out of the world. How many of you believe Noah was chosen out of the world? Can you believe building a ship in the middle of the nothing? Can you imagine? Noah was called. Build this boat, Noah. (laughs) What? Build this boat, Noah, because a hundred or so years from now, there's going to be water on the earth. Whatever, God, I'm going to do it. How many of you have that mentality? God, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do it because I know your strength will accomplish it in the earth. If you ask me to do it, it's going to get done might not be finished by me. Someone behind me might finish it, but I'm going to lay the legwork. Amen? Amen? We live in a world of darkness, folks. Yeah, we do. You know, each one of you in this room might be the only light that those around you see. Let that light shine. 
Let that light be an overcomer. We are chosen out of this world like Noah was, that we might be saved from it. From what? From the world. And become witnesses against it. Against what? Against the world. Against that Cain spirit. Against the world who's trying to cause everybody to walk in darkness. You know what so impresses me sometimes is when it's dark and all the spirit moves in, light just shines. Amen? As you walk in the Holy Spirit, darkness cannot overpower you. It's like the enemy walks up against your light and says, oh man, he's got that light shining again. I go find somebody else. Right? How can I, how can I put that light up? Yeah, you can. How can I put that light out? I know what I'll do. I'll bring discouragement. I'll make this guy walk in pride. I'll make this guy walk in, in self-righteousness. I'll make this guy see things that he could have if he just... What do you tell to Jesus? Just, just, just worship me and I'll give you all this. And Jesus says, look, dude, it's in the Word. It doesn't belong to you. Everything that's in the word is true. And yes and amen. Get away from me, devil. You know the thing is, too, about that temptation that Christ had? How long did it take the devil? How long did it take before the devil showed up? How many? 40 days. No food, no water. 40 days. The enemy shows up. Oh, I got it now. He's tired. He's hungry. I got him. But the spirit says, wait a minute. You're a liar. You're still a liar. And once that happened, what happened? You remember? You remember what happened after he shooed the devil away and he went off? You remember what happened? He was fed and watered. Yeah. Yeah. Who showed up? Angels, Angels showed up. Who? I'm getting goosebumps. Angels showed up. Yep. There's a story about a pastor from Boston. He was driving in his car one day, and he swerved to miss another car. Ran right smack into an electric pole. The pole broke, fell down on top of his car. Thousands of volts of electricity went through his car. Mm -hmm. Melted the car, caught the car on fire. He couldn't get out. The seatbelt was stuck. It was just melting. Looks out the burning window, and here comes a guy walking down the road. Opens the car door, pulls the guy out, set him on the thing, says, I gotta go now, I'm left. Never seen him, never heard from him, nobody ever seen him. An angel showed up and said, I'm gonna rescue you. Oh my goodness. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's just a story. No, no, no. Ask the guy. It's real. Has anybody had an angel show up in their life and you didn't realize, hey, there's an angel there? Yes. Right? I should be dead, but. I was saved. I was saved. Hallelujah. By faith, like Abraham, we must go out. If you read your Bible, you'll see that Abram didn't even know God. You want me to do what? Didn't even know God. Didn't worship. Didn't nothing. Just, just nothing. God says, I don't want you to leave this place, and I want you to go over here. This is coming, this is a man called that never worshiped, never knew God. And God still used him. God had to change his name, but God still used him. Sometimes we hang out in the bushes too long. Sometimes when God says go, we need to say, okay, Lord, which way? We need to say, Abram did it, I'm going to do it. Friendship. I have called you friends. To be called friends by him who is God's best friend is an honor that we need to cherish. Sometimes in our walk, in our life, we've claimed we've had special friends. I had one friend in my entire life. One. And that's a friend I told you about going back and back against the gangs. One friend. And then the Lord brought me my wife, my second friend. Don't get me wrong. You know, friends, sometimes they, you know, clash. But we're still friends. Amen? Amen. Amen? So when Christ calls you his friend, wear it proudly. Not so proud that you begin to be haughty, 
but proud to know that you've been called Jesus' friend. You've been called. You've been chosen. I have called you my friend. And if friends should stick closer than a brother, I know that probably more than a lot of you. I have four brothers. And friends have stuck closer to me than my brothers. I've got friends right here in this church that I know if I needed something, all they have to do is call. But I gotta get the courage to call. It was a blessed day for Mordecai. How many of you remember the, the story of Mordecai? Esther chapter 6, verse 11. It was a blessed day for Mordecai when he was declared the friend of the king. You're my friend, Mordecai. What did he go through before that happened? Mordecai went through stuff, didn't he? Mordecai stood at the gate and said, hey, you guys better watch out. But then God brought up a niece. Sent her to the court. Through what God did in that, Mordecai was called friend by the king. You are called friend by the king. The king of kings and the lord of lords has called you friend. He's chosen you and called you. You are my friend. And to those of us in here that don't quite understand the friendship, this is like on level 45 million over whatever. Servants have kitchen privileges. We have any servants. Okay. okay. <laughs> I say that because these two work together. I mean you know that. Servants. Servants have kitchen privileges. But friends have parlor opportunities. We have the privilege as friends, as acquaintances, to be involved in all the opportunities that God has laid out for us. We don't have to go just to the kitchen and eat scraps off the table like servants had to do, right? You couldn't eat with those that are putting on the party. You had to go in the kitchen and eat what was left over. Aren't you glad today that you can sit right on that banquet table with the Lord Jesus Christ and consume everything and anything that he lays in front of you? Why? It's because he's called you friend. You have an opportunity this morning to accept that and walk in the fact that you are God's friend. Anywhere in the Lord's house is an honor. I've heard people say, man, if I can just make it, if I, I'll, I'll push a broom, if I can just get there. Any place in the house of the Lord is an honor. I cleaned toilets for years in the house of the Lord. And I got more honor from sticking my head over a urinal than I did in a lot of places. You might say, well, that's kind of crazy. No, it's because you give you the opportunity to listen to what God's telling you. And he gives you an opportunity to even in the bathroom to worship him. How many of you sang in the bathroom, the acoustics in the bathroom? It's like, whoa. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. And then you say, oh, I'm, good thing I don't sing like that out there because they shut me up. The house of the Lord is an honor and a blessing. But covet earnestly the best gifts. What's the best gifts? The best gifts are all the gifts that Jesus has supplied for us through his death and resurrection. Those are the best gifts. The best gift that he can give us is he will call you friend. I love this if. If you abide in It doesn't come willy-nilly down the pipe. You have to abide in him. And how do we abide in him? If you remember a couple weeks ago, how do we abide in him? By reading, by praying, and walking in relationship with Christ. That's how we abide. We renew our minds. Number four, teaching. All things I have made known to you. Look at verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, 
For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Can you think about that for a minute? All the things that Jesus and Abba Father have talked about, he has made known to us. If we abide in him. If we read the book, I'm going to say this as lightly as I can, falsely, we'll never understand the abiding. And what do I mean by falsely? If we read the Bible as a book, we won't get it. But if we read it as the word of God, God sent to us to regenerate us, to renew our mind, it's an understanding that we go, man, I don't even get that, but that's okay, I'll receive it. Amen? Amen. But I'll tell you what, I don't know how many of you have read the Bible more than once, twice, three times, five times, but I'll guarantee you, every time you have, there's something new. Yep. When did you put that in there? I thought this was written all the years ago. No, it was time for you to get it now. Isn't that awesome? That's just like, whoa. Can you blow my mind anymore, Lord? When'd you put that there? Now's the time you need. I have called you friends. I am teaching you all things. What my father and I talk about, I'm telling you. Jesus is the great teacher that has come from God. Now, sometimes people take that, the great teacher or whatever, and have come from God. But what they fail to realize is Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is human side of God. Amen? Amen. Jesus is God in the flesh. 100% man, 100% God. Don't separate them. Can you imagine hearing all this and going through all this if Jesus never came? Truth, you wouldn't be. Because there'd be no reason. Because this would have never got written if the plan wasn't to bring him. It's from the beginning, Genesis 1-1, all the way to the end. It's all about Jesus. Oh, that's in the Old Testament. Thank God it's in the Old Testament, right? Yeah. Exactly. He has sought. I love this. I was writing this. I said, Lord... You're actually looking for us. You're actually, it's hot in here, isn't it hot in here? Yes. Can we, can we turn that down? Or, are you cold? Yeah. Are you cold? You're cold? Yeah, you're working. That's why well, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Where am I at? As he sought to install in the minds, as I was preparing for this, I thought to myself, Lord, you are actually looking seeking to put something in our minds. And what mind is he talking about? He's not talking about your flesh mind. He's talking about your spirit mind. Mm -hmm. Because folks, understand this. What's ever in your brain will eradicate and go away unless it gets into your spirit. That's right. Amen? So don't let yourself be controlled by what you think, but be controlled by what you know. Get it out of your thinker into your knower. Because the devil can mess with your thinker. Yeah. Yeah. Right? He has sought to install into the minds of the disciples, and how many of you know you're a disciple, all the things that he heard from his father. So by the Holy Spirit, he does and still makes known to us the will of the Father if we listen. Lord, what's your will for me today? And then go on and play backgammon or cheese or or something. You need to sit long enough for him to speak to you. Yeah. Amen? Amen? You need to rest. Those who wait upon the Lord Amen. will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Keyword, wait. Sit in that chair right there and wait because I've got it for you. And sometimes I think, Lord, in my disobedience, is that why you wait so long to give me something? <laughs> because I told you to wait. Not one minute, not two minutes, not three minutes. However long it takes your hand to speak to you. 
Some of us go through eternity on earth and never hear the word of God. So we think. The Spirit will always communicate. We need to keep asking Holy Spirit to reveal what's been spoken to my heart. Amen? Amen. He wants us to know the will of the Father. For all things are now delivered to him. All thing is delivered to Christ. And he wants us to know those things. And the Spirit takes the things which are his and shows them to us. How many of you ever had it? I remember in, in kindergarten, first grade, wherever it was. You know what my hobby was? What? I had a tricycle. I ran over all the milk cartons and all the blocks and all that stuff. Why? It's because I didn't sit long enough for the teacher to teach me anything. Why I did it, I don't know, boredom, whatever, meanness, angry, maybe I needed more spanking, spanking than I got. But the thing is, is we, is he's there to show us if we're there to listen. I remember, I remember going to an algebra class, and I, what am I going to algebra class for? I can't do any vision. So, it just so happened that the wrestling coach was the algebra teacher. And I was an all-state wrestler. So, my algebra teacher wanted me to be in algebra so I wouldn't thump, flunk, and not be able to wrestle. So guess what my job was in algebra? Correct the papers. I didn't have to do any. I just had to correct the papers. Was that wrong? Yes. Because I was in there to learn algebra. I was put in there for the wrong reason. So I never learned algebra. But I got a good grade. Which doesn't mean a hill of beans when it comes to algebra. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Sometimes we are put in a position, oh, it's okay, you just rest. We'll make, we'll make it happen. No, it doesn't work that way or shouldn't work that way. We have the Spirit giving us all things that Him and the Son have talked with the Father. We have responsibility. Jesus says, I have chosen you. Verse 16, go there. Do not choose, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appoint you that you should go and bear fruit and that fruit, your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I have been chosen. Why? Question mark. I think because we can receive the word. We knew he was going to receive the word. Well, the question mark that we have to ask ourselves, Lord, why, why, why did you choose me? Why? Why have you chosen me? Why have you done it? Three words. To bear, to bear fruit. Amen. To bear fruit. That's why God has chosen you. Read, read what we've just been reading. I've called you to be fruit bearers. So he's called us. The reason he's called us is to bear fruit. Some of us get discouraged because we never bear fruit. But you planted seeds. Right. Amen? Amen? You planted seeds. And someone comes along and waters that seed. Someone comes along and harvests that seed. You are just responsible for the bearer of the fruit than the guy that picks it. Amen. Amen. I have chosen you, why? To bear fruit. Having called his disciples friends and having instructed them to the things concerning himself, you know he hasn't stopped teaching us about himself in the word. It never stops. Be ye holy because I'm holy. When's that happen? Uh, not while you're here? <laughs> it's a process, isn't it? Yes. We will never achieve the same holiness that God expects while we're in this mortal body. But that doesn't mean we don't try to achieve it. That doesn't mean our ducks aren't in the road. That doesn't mean we love one another. That, that just means we obey what God has asked us to do. And one day, we're going to hear these words. Well done. Well done. Sometimes I talk to people that, I'll never be holy, I'll never be accepted. You've already been accepted. What do you mean? The blood of Christ has already accepted you. Right. You've been accepted. Now it's up to you to walk in the exception. Mm -hmm. 
He expects them to be something else than mere patience in a doctor's hand. Jesus expects us to be more than patience in the waiting room at the doctor's office. He's expected us to, to love that has grown into friendship. We must go and be ripened enough to the fruitful service that he's called us to do. We've been called to be faithful. We've been called to be abiders. We've been called to be fruit bearers. But we can't do any of that without abiding in him. Y'all heard the vine, right? Well, you know who the you know who the uh, branch is? Branch is Jesus. Branch is God. <coughs> we are engrafted into that. Not a people, place, or thing, but into that. We are engrafted into God. We are, the vine is Jesus, and we are the ones that are, are growing, in, and that's why we get pruned. Some of you in here have fruit trees. Have you ever seen those suckers, how they dry out a, a branch? What do you do with the suckers? You prune them. Right? Because the, the sucker will draw the nutrition out, out of the limb, the branch, that feeds your fruit. So what we have to learn to do is cut them suckers off. That's draining us from having the nutrition and the power to be fruit bearers. So we have to examine ourselves. Lord, what do I need to cut out of my life? And nine times out of ten, folks, it has to do with something in your own mind. It has to do with something that you're involved in. Let it go. You know what God you can replace God with anything. You could be. You, you could have a love for, for cars. And if that love for that car is bigger than God, that's now your idol. Yeah. You can have a love for shoes. And if those shoes get in the way of God, that's now your idol. Sounds kind of silly, it doesn't have an idol like that. They're there. You might want to have the best groom on and you do all you can to groom it. This and that and this and that. That's become your idol. There's nothing wrong with having God first and then grooming your lawn. Don't get me wrong. But it has to be in perspective. God is always first. Everything else is that. A fruitless branch never serves the purpose of the vine. A barren Christian, a Christian that has no fruit, Professing is a misrepresentation of Christ. A barren Christian professing, a professing barren Christian who's never even planted a seed is mis misrepresentation of Christ. Does that make any sense? That's kind of hurtful, Pastor, but it's true. If you keep it to yourself, if you walk, well, I'm going to be as holy as I can be and I'm going to keep it to myself, you're not going to produce any fruit. A little word here, a little word there plants a seed. And that seed comes and gets watered. Next thing you know, you've got people asking you questions that you thought were never hearing or never listening. We need to be fruit bearers. A barren Christian, a professing barren Christian is a misrepresentation of Christ. Chosen or ordained to bring forth Fruit. We are chosen and ordained to bring forth fruit. We shouldn't be one of those believers that go to church and Wednesday and whatever day of the week you go to church because there's churches you can go to church every night of the week and you can show people how important you are but you have not professed Christ one time in front of anyone. And God says, I never knew you. I don't know about you, but that would be devastating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never knew you would get away from me. But we did, but we did, but we did. But you did it for the wrong reason. That's right. Matthew 24 and 25. Get away from me. Can you imagine? Get away from me. I never knew you. That'd be terrible. I never knew you. Brotherly love, verse 17. These things I command you so that you will love one another. 
It's a command that we love one another. Love is the bond that is to hold his people one to another in the middle of hatred and from the opposition of the world. There is no reason for a true believer in Christ to think he's in this alone or she's in this alone. Because you're not. You choose to be. And when worship time comes around, all the excuses begin to, oh, I can't go, I need to do this. I need to. Hey, folks, I'm telling you the truth. Oh, I, 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 I can't, I need, to, I need, I need, I need, I need. No, you need to set it down and go to where God will feed you. Amen. Why do you think Paul said, hey, they, they can't eat meat? Oh, my dear They can't eat meat, so I'm going to give them some porridge. Why? It's because they don't have the strength or the teeth or the maturity to give them the steak that I want to give them. Why is that? Because they choose not to be grown-ups in Christ. They choose not to mature. And I, 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 I'm going to say this, and I hope it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings, but the biggest Bible that you can buy and you're carrying under your shoulders and you're still, the pages aren't wrinkled, who cares? So you're carrying the biggest Bible to show people, you know, i got a big Bible. So what? Do you read it? What's it say? What's Genesis 1 say? Oh, I don't know. But if you're walking around, and don't get me wrong, I, if you have a Bible that's been worn for 40 years, you just lift up your Bible. Flip. Look at that thing. And some of you in here have been on your fourth or fifth, sixth Bible. Why? It's because you're tearing that thing apart. Amen. That, I didn't mean that facetiously. But we're commanded, commanded, commanded to love one another. And be and, 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 and love one another even in the middle of hatred and opposition of the world. Folks, let me warn you about something. There's going to be a time when the opposition is going to be in your face. There's going to be a time when the opposition, there's going to be a time that you wish you knew where the next Christian was on the next street you're living on. There's going to be a time when you're going to want to know what's happening around you. But it's not going to bother you. Because greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Amen. His new commandment of loving one another, which is a sum of the whole law. Remember the law? Love one another? Remember that? Jesus fulfilled that thing, didn't he? Sometimes we get so lost in all the other sacrifice this, and you can only eat meat this day, and you can have this day and this day. But there's only ten commandments that God expects us to stand by, right? All the other stuff was just for those that wanted the law. They wanted to be shown, how am I going to go wrong? That's why the law was introduced, because they need to be shown. What, what can I what can I can I do? Sometimes we see people groups and we tell ourselves, well, that, they're, they got all together. No, they don't. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. No, they're not. Look at the Old Testament. You can say, oh, man, they kind of blew it. Over and 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 over. When Jesus came, and died on the cross and shed his blood. Who's that guy? Who's that guy? The same thing will be said about you folks as you share Christ, as you share the blood. Who are you to tell me? I'll tell you who I am. I'm a chosen vessel of the living God. And I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me. And I'm here to plant a seed in you whether you like it or not. I remember my grandfather over here in the river bottom trying to plant stuff in that rock hard red clay, terrible soil. He beat those rocks and he dig he dig down below the rottenness, which is pretty far, if you know what I mean. And he plants something. And then he had to water it. Then he had to make sure all the weeds and stuff didn't get around it. You folks know you're planting gardens. Some of you here got gardens. You know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the dirt up here. Right? The rock. <laughs> there ain't no dirt. It's all rock. We 
We need to have the salt of love in ourselves. And we will have peace with one another. There is no reason, folks, for a believer to have anything against another believer if the two believers are abiding in him. But the enemy will come along and say, hey, look, look what she just said. Or look what he just said. And instead of us saying, Lord, watch over them, protect them, guide them, we want to say, wait, ah, 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 yeah. No, we? Or we go home and do it. And the Holy Spirit say, hey, you think no one's listening, bro? <laughs> Do not love one another as an act of rebellion against the rule of Christ. Can you imagine not loving each other and you're disobeying the rule of Christ? You're disobeying the commandment of the Lord? You're disobeying the commandment of God if you're not loving one another? You know, you know what? I heard something the other day. I don't like this person, but I love them. My answer to mine was going, well, how is, what is that about? I don't like them, but I love them. You know why you can say that? Because the love of Jesus is different than the love of the world. Yeah. I don't like what you're doing. I don't like your reactions. I don't like how you act, but I love you with the love of Christ. Yeah. Hate the sin, love the sin. Amen? Number seven, promise. I will send you the Spirit. Jesus will send from the Father a helper, a comforter. This promised helper is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth will reveal the word to us. This spirit of truth, this devil diluted world cannot receive because it does not see him. This world is, is divided by the devil and the lies of the devil so they can't see the spirit of truth. Turn back to John 14. And we'll go to John 17. I'll, I'll start with 15. If you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so far, what's the only commandment that we need to understand? Have no other gods before me and love one another. Amen? Now, if we go back to the original ten, there's idols and there's gods, all that stuff. We're not worried about that right now. We're worried about the ten that makes us walk stronger in Him. Amen? I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper or comforter to be with you forever. Verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I don't know about you, but that's some powerful stuff. You know the prophets in the Old Testament, the Bible says the Spirit came and went, came and went, came and gave them something to say, say this to who, and Jeremiah say this to him, they came and went, came and went, came and went. Do you know we have the same ability, but it dwells in us every minute of every day? Jesus sent him to us from the Father to dwell in us, to produce in us a desire to serve him. The promise, the Spirit Christ promised us every needful thing for life and service. That's why the Spirit's dwelling in us, to give us everything we need for service and to walk in the life that He's called us to walk in. Don't ever count the Spirit out of your life. If you've heard all the negative stuff, well, the Spirit ain't here today. Wrong. If you heard stuff, well, you don't need the Holy Spirit. Wrong. If you heard stuff, well, that's for New Testament times when Paul died again. Wrong. The Spirit is just as active today as it was when Christ gave it to us. Are you walking in it? Are you receiving Him? Are you looking forward to Him? Are you saying, Holy Spirit, give me some power, give me some strength? Or do you still have Him on the shelf? I believe this. If you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, when that happened, He moved in. Now all you have to do is take the cobwebs off. 
You have to utilize the gift that he's given you. Look in your Bible. Look what the Spirit is. Look what the gifts of the Spirit are and walk in those. Because they're for you. And they're for me. And they're for all those who call upon the name of the Lord. It belongs to us. He's given us. He's given us the Spirit. He's given us the Comforter. He's given us the Helper for one purpose and one purpose only. To be fruitful. And multiply. Acts 1.8. Read it. In the promising of the Spirit, we are ready and we have the needful things for life and service. He is the Spirit of truth, of grace, of a burning desire to serve Him, and of power. What did Jesus say? He said, I'm going to give you the ability, I'm going to give you the power to what? Heal the sick? Raise the dead? Be a voice for me? It doesn't come in your own understanding. It comes in His. Have you ever been someplace and you're getting inside and you're just going, what's going on? What's going on? And all of a sudden, the Lord shows you something and it's an individual or whatever else. Oh, be scared. Don't worry. Let the Holy Spirit do it. You know what? If you haven't experienced that, oh, man, what, what am I doing here? I've got you here for a reason. Amen? After a while, when you begin to use that more and more, it's a comfortable spot. Lord, who am I talking to today? Who am I going to pray for today? Amen? Almost finished. Be patient. What a helper he is. How fruitless our testimony would be without him. I will send him to you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive everything that he has to offer you and let him renew your minds and your hearts and your spirit because he's chosen you. He's chosen you to be a light in the middle of darkness. Don't let the King of Spirit keep you from walking in truth, walking in peace, walking in grace. Let that burning desire to be fruitful just, just bust into you. Amen. Done. Aren't you glad? No. No. You're thirsty. You don't have seven? Seven is promise. Oh, oh, five, seven. <laughs> I will send you the Spirit. You know, when you begin to use the gifts that God's given to you, and you begin to walk in them. It's like baby steps, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like when it's like when God says, I want you to pray for this individual. What? Mm -hmm. I want you to pray. But if nothing happens, it's okay. I still want you to pray. Mm -hmm. And then there's time to pray for somebody. Oh man, they start wiggling and everything. Oh, man, everything's cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't let the enemy deter you from doing what God's called you to do because you don't see the result. Amen? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can come before you in peace and joy and hear from you today, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being such a part of our life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that whenever we walk in this room, you bring rejoicing. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you bring protection upon us to not hear the things of the world that causes, causes discord or distrust. Because you know, we know you are with us always. Even to the end of the age. You told us, Jesus, you would be with us always. We thank you for that promise. We thank you, Lord, that we can come before you today and give you all thanks give you all praise and give you all glory. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, to get the stuff you speak to us into our hearts, into our knower, that we can walk in the peace that surpasses any and all understanding. In Jesus' name, in God's people's name. Amen. Amen. Yeah.